Who is the worst legendary in every faction? And how do we make them better? So someone asked me in my Twitch stream the other night, over at twitch.tv slash jgigs, by the way, uh, who I thought was the worst legendary in the game now, after the recent buffs, now that Machalet is no longer on that list, uh, who did I think was the worst legendary in the game? And I just kind of thought about it. it. It's kind of been in my head for a few days, like who who would be at the bottom of the of the tier list now? Uh, so I, I started peeking around, and then I just I kind of had this idea that I would go through and pick out who I thought might be the worst one right now, and suggest suggest some ways to make them better. Now this is really just more of kind of like a fun I, idea video to spark a discussion. So so what I would like is for you to tell me in the comments who you think are some of the worst legendaries in the game. What are some changes you think would make them better? And then, of course, if you want to give any thoughts on anything I say in this video, uh, of course, I would like to hear them. So this is not, you know, it, you get it. You get what you get. What we're doing here, right? So let's just start at the top and work our way through the list. So, Banner Lords. Now, I think as far as being a lackluster faction, Banner Lords is probably at the top of the list. Um, they, they have so many champions here to have so little going on. <laughs> um, that not that there are no good banner lords, but I just feel like it's a very decked out faction to just not have that much going on, man. I feel like there's, there, they could really be doing a lot of better things in here uh, with, with these champs. But for my list, worst legendary in the faction, I went with Rigtov. I think that he is just not... Uh, I just think that he's not interesting enough. So let's talk about what I think should be done with him. He's got an A1 at AoE, and it's got the destroy proc built into it, which is not really that useful. His A2 is a three-hitter that... It attacks one enemy three times, but it places poisons on all enemies. It's kind of a strange skill, but there you have it. And then his A3, crit damage. It attacks one enemy. Crit damage increases by 20%. For each poison debuff on the target stacks up to 100%. I think it's pretty easy on, on what to do with this guy to make him good. I think swap his A1 and A2, right? So just make this his A1 and just let it put the three poisons on the one enemy he hits. It doesn't have to put him on all enemies. Just let it be a three hitter, three poison skill. His second skill becomes an AoE. You can leave, take or leave the destroy proc. And then this. Just make it a passive. Remove the attack, make it a passive. He's a legendary with two active skills. You put his new A2 on a three turn cooldown. Now he's a solid clan boss poisoner. He's got a good AoE if you wanted to use him in dungeons and other places. And he's got a passive that is also very useful in clan boss because generally you're trying to stack poisons. Now he's gonna have basically 100 bonus crit damage every time he attacks. I think that makes him pretty viable. I think that I think that those are some simple changes that make this dude really good. Swap A1 and A2, make this now, just put the poisons on one target. Again, just a regular AOE for A2, make this a passive. I think now he's a viable clan boss champ. I think he's a viable dungeon champ. I think it, uh, I think it does some things to make that dude a little more interesting. Let's move on to High Elves. Now this one, this is another interesting one because there's some killer champs in here. And then there are not so, there are some not so killer champs. Now this might be a little bit of a controversial choice because he's a Void. But I just think that for a Void Legendary, this dude does not have enough going on. So here's what I think should change. His A1, he places a crit rate buff on all allies if he crits himself with his A1. This is silly because by the time you're deep enough in a fight for him to be using his A1, putting a crit rate buff on all allies is kind of silly anyway. I think remove that from the skill, and now if it crits, uh, it stuns. If A1 crits, it stuns. There. Now he's got a little bit of crowd control built in. There's a little bit of utility in that skill and there's a reason for it, right? Uh, his A2, remove all this, uh, remove all this other stuff about the defense buff and just let him place the defense down and weaken on a target. If it kills someone, then he attacks. If it kills someone, he just gets another turn, right? Forget this defense buff thing. I don't understand that. 
It's kind of a silly, again, it's another silly mechanic. I think uh, if he does this, it just gives him gives him another turn, right? If, if he kills. So he places defense down and weaken on a target. If it kills, he gets another turn. A3 attacks one enemy will heal this champion equal to any surplus damage if the target is killed. Killed? Killed? I think that this one attacks one enemy will heal the team equal to any surplus damage if the target is killed. And if their health is full or the heal fills their health up, it shields over the top, right? And I know some of you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot. That's that's a lot to give this dude. He's a void legendary. <laughs> He's a void legendary that sits in my vault. Nothing to him. I know I know most people that have a Bellinor keep this dude in the vault. So I think yeah, maybe that's some pretty strong stuff. Maybe it would need to be tweaked later, but he's a friggin' void legendary. Make this dude interesting, right? And then this one I didn't bother with touching because, you know, whatever. Uh, I think the crit rate buff is cool. I think giving him a stun or something on the A1 would be nice. Anyway, we've talked about what I think should be done with Bellinor. I'll be interested to know what you guys think about not only that choice, but the suggestions to make him better. Sacred Order... This was a toss-up between uh, Abbas and Errol. I went with Errol because Abbas has... Abbas, I don't know how to say it. She has an AoE defense break, which automatically bumps up utility, even if the rest of the kit is garbage. And really, her kit's not that bad. She could be better, but I think this dude's worse. So let's talk about how to make this dude better. Attacks one enemy, 30% chance of inflicting a, a critical hit. Attacks one enemy three times, 30% chance of inflicting a crit hit. Each hit has a 50% chance to ignore defense. Third skill, steals all buffs from an enemy target, then attacks the target, has an extra 30% chance. Okay, so first thing we do with this guy is we take out that extra 30% chance of inflicting a critical hit and make it a passive. He just has a passive where he has a 30% chance of <laughs> inflicting a critical hit, an extra 30% chance. Don't put that in every skill, just make it a friggin' passive, right? And then his A1... Let's give him let's give him a 60% defense break on his A1. Okay. Now he's got an A1 defense break. This gives him some utility in dungeons. Here, now we've got a three hitter that has a good chance to ignore defense. There's some, there's potential heavy damage out of this skill now. Uh, and and it's it's less wordy. And here, steals the buffs and then attacks the target. And then maybe we could give him a little bit of ignore defense here too. Um, or do the if it kills gets another turn. There's a couple of different ways you could go with this one, but I think basically just make this less wordy. Make give him a passive down here that all all attacks have a 30% chance of inflicting a critical hit, and that's it. I, th I think give him a turn one defense break because he's got no debuffs, right? Give him a turn one defense break, and I think there could be something else here. Steel steals buffs and attacks is nice. I think maybe give him ignore defense maybe even like ignores ignores 20 percent or 25 percent defense for every buff stolen how about that i think that, that would be pretty cool for him 25 percent defense ignore for every buff stolen right i think that's pretty good I think that would make him actually kind of interesting and kind of useful for barbarians we have elder scarg now again uh, not a lot of options here for bad. Alton's obviously great. Valkyrie's one of the best in the game. Turvold is fun, and this chick I think is not really that bad to be honest. But she's pretty new. But I think I don't I don't think there's much of a debate that Elder Scarg is the worst barbarian legendary. So I looked at him for a while because he's very different. He's he's very clearly for arena. He's very clearly for like rush card counter and stuff like that. When rush card was was a heavy thing we were seeing in arena. He's, he's very unique and interesting, and I think I think they tried to do some interesting things with him, and I think it just missed. So I think in the spirit of, of doing things interesting with him, what I would do is, for this one, attacks one enemy, 30% speed buff if it crits, crit rate buff if it doesn't crit. I would take all that away, and it would be attacks one enemy, and then he would place an unkillable buff on himself for one turn, if he landed a critical hit. I think that makes him r much more interesting in Arena. I think it's kind of a different mechanic, and it, it presents some issues, right? Because he's he's got all these interesting mechanics. I think that that would be another interesting mechanic. If he crits with his A1, 
he puts one an, a one turn unkillable buff on himself okay for his a2 attacks one enemy three times places an extra hit for each buff or debuff on the target can place up to three extra hits places hp burn for two turns and true fear for one turn if this attack places all three extra hits again kind of a kind of an interesting skill I think maybe doing something like each hit also has a 10 or 15% chance to steal a buff would be would be interesting for this skill. And again, I think it makes him a little bit more of a problem in Arena. I think it gives him some more utility. I think that that could be a fun one. And then for this one, I think it's fine. I think you could leave it. I think the passive can be left alone. I think the crit rate lead is fine. I think all those things are fine. But I think... The unkillable on a crit on his A... Because he's not going to be using his A1 every time, right? So it's not like permanent unkillable, and it's not like it couldn't be stripped. But if the fight's going to go on for a little bit and he's going to use his A1 occasionally, I think critting with that A1 and giving him that, that round of unkillable unless it can be stripped could be kind of an interesting take. Kind of kind of an interesting way to use him. So that's, that's my thoughts on Elder Scarred. Moving down to Ogren... This might be a controversial one right here. I have War Mother. Now, I don't think that's the controversy. I think the controversy is in how good I want to make her. And for any, any of my Summoner's War people, this is going to sound pretty familiar. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to know where I'm headed with this one, with her. But we, this would be one of those uh, Masha Led type buffs where it's drastic and she kind of creates a new meta, right? This, this, this changes the game in a lot of ways. But I do think that it would be fun. So, for her A1, I think you can leave the attack down if you like. I don't, I don't, I don't care about that, but I think you can leave it as a two-hitter. Every time she crits, she boosts her turn meter by 15% with this. So there's a potential 30% turn meter boost. The flip side of that is we remove the need for crit here because it annoys me that they tend to want to tie critical rate to bombers in this game. Generally, bombers, the bombs scale off of attack, so that's usually an opportunity to just pump attack onto someone and let them do their damage. But they always want to put these weird mechanics in with bombers where you need crit for them to truly be effective, right? And that, that's something that's always irked me about her. So here, you can add, you can put that crit rate stipulation on the A1 so that if people can or want to bother with it, she can help herself turn cycle a little bit, but it's not necessary, okay? A2 is no longer an AoE bomb. It's a single target bomb. Right? It can still place two, um, but it, it only puts them on one target, right? And it gives her another turn. So she places a, two bombs on someone and then gets another turn, okay? A3 is now no longer an attack. It just detonates all bombs, right? So A2, she, can place a, she places the bombs gets another turn a3 she can detonate him now oh and she, and now she has a speed lead for arena a 24 percent speed lead for arena now bomb teams become viable immunity runes now become necessary for arena strippers can become necessary in higher levels if you want to use a bomb comp because now if you, you could set it up in a way where you could build this team that strips stacks a bunch of bombs she comes in behind, detonates them all. Now you've kind of got this bomb cleave, right? So it's, of course, it can be countered. It can be dealt with. But she now becomes really interesting. Bomb teams now become viable. Immunity runes are now, you know, useful. Um, I, think, I think it would be an interesting shift. I think we would see some interesting things in Arena. And I think it would make her good. It, it kind of aggravates me that bombs are so useless in this game. I think Sh Shazar might be the only decent bomber in the game like he's the only bomber that's ever really been an issue um, so i think it would be cool if we had like a solid meta bomber like like that build so again it's drastic changes i'm sure some of y'all are going to have problems with that but uh, i i think that that would be interesting moving on to lizard men we have skull lord vargal i don't think there's going to be any pushback on this i think it's uh I think it's pretty safe to say this is the worst legendary in the lizard man faction. So let's see what we can't do about this dude, right? Let's see what we can't do about this dude. The first note I have on him is take his 
A2 and his A3 and swap them. So now his A2 becomes an AoE. And his, his A2 now is also AoE though, right? So now he puts strengthen on himself, but it's an AoE one turn provoke. And it's an A3 and you can, you can extend the cooldown, right? It can be a five turn or whatever. Swap A2 and A3. This skill now becomes an AoE provoke. Okay? And this one can stay the same. This can still be an AoE attack break. I think this gives him viability in dungeons as your as your tank. I think I think this would make a lot of things possible. You make this an A2 with a three turn cooldown. You make this an A3 with a five turn cooldown or whatever, right? I think that I think that immediately, just that change alone makes him interesting, but let's push it a little bit further. Horrific foe. When attacked, decreases the attacker's max HP by 5%. Cannot decrease blah blah blah, right? Doesn't work on bosses. True fear on targets who have been decreased by 20% or more. No one cares <laughs> about max HP uh, reduction. That's that's annoying. It's not meta anywhere. It doesn't really ever play much of a factor. I think just reworked this whole passive, and now it's just a 10% reflect. He reflects 10% of any damage done to him, period. I think that that's what this passive should be. Just reflects 10% damage. And then for this one, with the Skull's Horns, I think he revives them with 50% HP, but 100% turn meter. And he will he can revive multiple. So if you want to run him and four of them in Faction Wars, and they all die on one turn, he rev revives them all with 50% HP, and they get a turn. I don't think it's, I don't think it, like, maybe, maybe that would be a problem in Arena. Maybe, maybe it would need to be capped at, at two. He'll revive up to two. Or maybe he could still just revive one. But I think reviving them with the 50% HP and a full turn meter, so that if they're on lifesteal, they can heal themselves back up, potentially. Something like that would make him more interesting. Again, I, I don't think it would make him, like, the greatest in the game, but it gives him some viability. It gives a, it gives what was a farmable fusion some actual utility, right? Some some dungeon utility help you get through with the attack down and the provokes, the reflect damage. I think it makes him a little more interesting. Be interested interested to know what you guys think about that. Let's move on to Skinwalkers. I again, I don't I don't think there's much pushback here. I think Warchief is the worst Skinwalker, which is really been a bummer for me for a while. I've always I've always wanted this dude to be good. I've always wanted this dude to be better than he is. I keep wanting to try to do things with him and and figure out a way to make him viable. He just doesn't have enough going on. So what I think we could do, I think his A1 is fine. I think that's fine the way it is. Attacks an enemy three times, 25%, because he doesn't have a lot going on. So I don't think it's I don't think it's a problem to give him something like this for his A1, because this is a pretty strong A1, right? He's got really high base defense, he scales off defense, it's a pretty good chance of landing that provoke. A2. Attacks one enemy, places a provoke for three turns. Steals two random buffs from the target. I think this skill should be attacks three times at random. Each hit has a chance to land the provoke. And steals one buff. Each hit has a chance to steal one buff. So this could triple up and hit the same person. It could spread out and hit three people. But it introduces some RNG. And I've said before, the more RNG you can introduce into an arena defense, the more of a problem it can be, the harder it is to plan for. <clears throat> so I think I think making this a random three hitter with still the chance to play... May, maybe a two-turn provoke. Maybe we could drop it to two-turn provoke. And then a potential to steal a buff from every hit that he lands, whether it all be whether it be three buffs from one person because he hit him three times, or one from three, however it plays out, right? And then, one more change, he still reflects the damage. That's still the same, but instead of doing more damage for each ally, I think. I think we could scrap that and say, if the target that hit you. If the target that attacks you was provoked, then you have a 20% chance to counter, which is a lot of potential to keep them locked down with provokes, right? Now you're going to have to bring some sort of cleanse. You're going to have to have block debuffs. He's now kind of a problem that you're going to have to solve. Otherwise, if he gets a provoke up on somebody, 
it's going to be a real issue, right? Now he becomes really viable, I think, in arena defense. So I think that would make War Chief good, and I would really like to see that. I don't even know why. I don't even know why I want to see this dude be good, but I really do. I really do want this dude uh, to be better than he is. So that's my thoughts on how to make that happen. All right, moving on to Orcs. I think Orcs... I think Orc Legendaries might give Bannerlord some competition for, like, worst faction of Legendaries. Uh, of course, Warlord is, is cool. Beyond that, th this is a pretty crappy lineup. I actually had a little bit of trouble deciding who I thought <laughs> the worst was. I ended up settling on Grohack, which is a bummer because he looks super cool. I really like his skin, but I just think there's not enough here with his kit. So, let's talk about it. A1. Attacks two times at random. Each hit has a 35% chance of placing a 30% decreased speed debuff. Uh... Okay, first thing we do here is we remove the randomness from it. From, it's an A1. Like, that's silly. Let's not do that. Um, what we can do is it can still be a two-hitter. He can hit the target that you select and then randomly attack another, right? So it's still going to hit twice. It could hit the same person twice, but you're guaranteed to hit whoever you go after and then randomly attack someone else, and each hit has a chance to place an HP burn. Right now, I I, don't, I just for some reason think that would be fitting for him. I think I think that, that would be cool. Now he has an opportunity to spread out some HP burns um, with his A1. I think that would be kind of cool. For his A2 and A3, we're gonna do another one of those swap things where we swap. So this now becomes A3, but there's gonna be some changes. So now this this is an A2 and the other one's an A3. Except now, this also has a chance to stun. And what I'm thinking is maybe like a 60% chance by default, and maybe an 80% chance skilled up, or um, maybe even skilled up, it just becomes a 100% chance and it relies on accuracy. But I think the reset and the stun offers more utility here, um, because he does have a dungeon lead, so this this really helps you lock down someone in dungeons a little better. And it's going to be useful in other places too, but in the spirit of being useful in dungeons, this could keep someone, a, a target, out of the fight. And then this is now the A3. And instead of filling his own turn meter for enemies under a speed break, I think now what he does is he knocks, it's an AoE that knocks turn meter back by 30%, and also has a chance to stun. So now we've got a now we've got a dungeon champion who places HP burns and brings quite a bit of crowd control, turn meter knockback crowd control. On top of having the speed lead in dungeons, this could really give your team the opportunity to cycle around and stay on top in the higher levels, right? This I think this brings more utility, um, and it even makes him good in spider because again he's he's it's not crazy. It's not like a real AOE HP burn. But he does have turn meter reset. He does have AOE turn meter knockback. He can stun all the minions, and he can slowly spread HP burns out throughout the fight. So I think this makes him good in all the dungeons. I think this would be pretty interesting. I don't think it makes him too powerful. And uh, I think I think Grohawk would get a little bit of love <laughs> with those changes because he looks too dead gum cool to be useless, right? Moving on down to Demon Spawn. I'm, I'm saying this is the worst one. Maybe there's a debate to be had here. I almost went with him. It was almost this dude. But I just think... I just think... I don't know. I think this dude needs to be a little different. I think they focused... I think they focused on the wrong stuff. So, here's my suggestions for this guy. A1 can stay the same... A2 can stay the same. I actually don't think AoE block buffs is bad. I think that that's pretty decent. Um, I think where we make our changes here is we get rid of this passive. We scrap this passive. And this just becomes an A3. I'm still thinking about it. Still, still considering this. I think we I think we just make this an A3, but we take away ignore defense. If you want him to ignore defense, you can put him on a savage set, okay? And get it that way. 
and do it with masteries. I think I think ignoring shield and block damage is enough for this as an A3. I think block revive is still fine. Maybe it could even ignore a percentage of defense. I think that would be okay. And his new passive is when peril is used, there's a 25% chance to reset the cooldown and grant an extra turn. So basically use the skill again. Right? The ignore defense is the tricky part of that. Because then is it too strong? Maybe 25% chance is too much of a percentage. I was trying to find what I thought was a re would be a reasonable balance to make this guy potentially useful in Ice Golem. Because it's really hard. Like, Block Revive is a mechanic in Ice Golem that is really hard to implement. I don't really know any teams that really successfully implement Block Revive uh, in the higher stages, right? Because those dudes are so hard to kill. Like, it's so hard to go in and one-shot them with Block Revive champs. I'm trying to think of a way where he's reasonable for that and not unreasonable for PvP. So, maybe we say, maybe we say Scrap ignore shield and block damage. But it does ignore defense. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a heavy hitting A3. It attacks twice, ignores defense, still blocks revive, and it's an A3, and it's on a you know four or five turn cooldown, whatever. And then the passive can be, I don't know. Let's say let's say the passive is a twenty percent chance to to grant an extra turn and reset the cooldown on the A3. So that way, you get, you get him into Ice Golem, you get him to 20, you hit one of the adds, you don't kill, but you get lucky in the passive procs, you get another shot, and he can probably two-shot, right? So then you take one of the adds out of the fight. I think that makes him, I think that's interesting enough, right? Get rid of the secret skill thing, he can keep a speed lead, he can keep all the other stuff, he just now has an A3, scrap the shield and block damage thing, it's just a, a heavy-hitting A3 that ignores defense and has a block revive. And the passive gives him a 20% chance of resetting the cooldown and using the skill again. Or getting another turn, I should say. I think I think I think I dig that. I think I dig that actually. Let's 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 let's, let's go at that. Undead hordes. Old Susan. I don't I don't again, not I don't think I'm gonna get a lot of pushback on that. This dude is not <laughs> not that interesting. So A1. We can leave it alone. A1 can be what it is. A2. 50% chance of placing weaken. If the weaken is not placed, places defense break. I think that that's silly. I think that he's a legendary. Let him place weaken and defense down. Let's not be silly about it. Let's just give him an AoE weaken and defense down. It would not kill the game to have another one of those. Okay? It's not like that those are... Um, you know, super easy. What, Draco and Venus? And, and maybe there's another one I'm forgetting about that does it AoE? Wouldn't It wouldn't kill to let this dude do that, right? So I think A2 is just, he places weakened and defense down AoE. And I think his A3 removes shield, block damage, and unkillable buffs from all enemies and then attacks them. Places heal reduction on all enemies. So basically he strips, again, kind of like a Rosh card um, type thing counter i think you can leave all that the same and let him place block buffs as well as heal reduction so he strips all that stuff off and then kind of locks down which makes him a pretty decent counter for everybody except man eater because he's even though he can strip the unkillable he can't strip the the block debuffs right so he can't place his debuffs but i think everybody else he gets to strip and then he places heal reduction and block buffs i think that that um I think that makes this dude a little more viable. Yeah, pretty simple changes for him, but I think that that uh, I think that, that works. Dark Elves, I went with Astrolith. I think for A1, instead of fill, filling the turn meter of a random ally, she fills her own, and then if it crits, still fills the rest of the teams by an extra 15%. Uh, I just think it would make a little more sense Based on her character, her design, and what they kind of seem to be going for with her, it makes sense for me that she would turn cycle herself. 
So I think I think making her turn cycle herself would be the way to go there. Uh, and then give her an HP burn. Why not, right? Let, let her A1 have an HP burn. A2 I think is fine. A3. Does everything it does right now is fine, but also does what A2 does. Also places a bomb that detonates in one turn. I think this makes her a little more of a problem. I think the HP burn could be a little bit of a nuisance. She's turn cycling herself um, regularly. And now now she's a, a certified bomber, right? I think that that... Uh, I think that uh, pretty simple changes for her, but I think that that makes her a little bit more interesting as well. Knight's Rev, Bystifus, arguably the worst <laughs> legendary in the whole game right now. I think he's in the conversation. Again, another bummer. He looks really cool. He looks like a he looks like a good Disney villain for some, somehow to me, uh, but but in a cool way, like like in a cool raid way. I think his skin is super dope. His swords are awesome. I think he's cool looking. Um, sucks that he's not good. So here's what we do with him. This skill has a 30% chance of granting him an extra turn. It does what it, it does exactly what it does here, but also 30% chance of getting an extra turn. Bam. I think that that's interesting. I think his A2 attacks all enemies, inflicts a critical hit against targets under block cooldown skills, heals by 20% of inflicted damage. Remove this middle part. This skill always crits. It's a guaranteed crit. A3 attacks four times at randoms. Random does blah 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 what it does. Uh, remove the randomness. It's another AoE. It does this AoE. AoE defense break, AoE block cooldown skills. You could even drop the block cooldown skills to one turn if that seems more reasonable. Um, but it, it is not a random hitter, it is an AoE. And then for the speed, give him a for the for the aura, give him a speed aura. Give him a speed aura. And give him a good one. Give him like a like like an like Astrid, like a 28%. Something a little odd. Something a little bit better than what you're used to seeing. Now he's got an AoE defense break and a, and a block cooldown skill. He's got an AoE that always crits, and his base attack is through the roof, so it's going to be pretty good damage. And here he gets a chance of giving himself an extra turn and a speed lead. Now I think now I think Bystifus is uh, is super relevant. I think he's close to the top, right? not close to the top, but I think he I think he steps up quite a bit from being near the bottom. And then dwarves, I sat here staring at dwarves for a minute. Um, I just don't think any of them are bad. <laughs> I don't think any of them need to be changed. Torment obviously is fine. Some people act like they act like they don't think Molly's good. Y'all are tripping on Molly. Uh, Mountain King, if, if you think Mountain King's bad, cl climb yourself up in Arena a little bit and let him hit you and see how you feel. And then Trenda's killer, man. She's got a lot of crowd control and HP burns. I just don't think there's a bad one. There's, I, I couldn't think of any changes that I wanted to make. My only complaint about here would be, I guess, give us more. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess it's a bummer. No, no dwarves to talk bad about. Um, but that's it. That's, that's my list. A little bit of a longer video. Again, we're just kind of having some fun. Uh, it is meant to spark a discussion. It is, uh, I want to hear what you guys think. If you agree with any of my selections of who I think the worst legendaries were, what you think about my suggested buffs for them, uh, what kind of buffs you would like to see. All that stuff. And then, uh, you know, maybe we'll do another one soon where we do, like, the strongest Legos in each faction and or, or most broken Legos in each faction and, and maybe how to nerf them. I don't know that there's enough broken legendaries for a video like that, but I don't know. We'll figure out some fun other stuff like this to do in the future. But I am very interested to know what you guys think about all of this on many different levels. So be sure and get with me in those comments below. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Blah, blah, blah. All the YouTube stuff. Thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it. <laughs> and I'll see you later. <laughs>